سلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین اللهم صل علی محمد و علی محمد So we've discussed 36 lessons up to now I think up to 36 from 37 to 47 the discussions are on matter and they are all pre preliminary discussions for the second milestone so I thought maybe with your permission I won't continue that now it's not a good subject to end with because it's just preliminaries and yes so I thought you'd go through some practical implications of the, ide the ideas that we've discussed up to now the I, its evolution, its how it evolves and how it plays a role even in fiqhi issues when you want to give a rule how this influences it okay so going first to a few basics that we studied that here with the embryo one cell stage this embryo is a, at fertilization it's unicellular yes there was an egg and the egg was fertilized by um, a sperm now you have something it has life this unicellular organism we call it an organism it's a human organism and it's growing after fertilization and we do we say it does have a soul and the soul is vegetative and material look it's a material soul there's no eye and this material soul is producing moment to moment material parts of the embryo it's growing and producing more and more when we say so a soul is material we mean this soul depends on matter existence wise i.e. if you were to end the matter if you were to destroy it or if it was to perish the soul would cease to exist that's a material soul we have immaterial souls I'll explain that in a minute so anyway, this grows with different parts of the embryo which grows with it at four lunar months approximately it's not the same for everyone but the legal criterion is four lunar months here this embryo now we say becomes reaches a stage is called ensoulment where it has an immaterial uh, a dimension to it and that immaterial dimension was knowledge and knowledge the reality of knowledge is immaterial knowledge isn't a physical or it's not material and since knowledge starts here with its perceptions albeit rudimentary and basic here the eye starts the container of that knowledge but knowledge is immaterial now here we said it's a material soul it depends on matter existence wise here it's an immaterial soul the immaterial soul needs matter to act for example if we want to do salat we need a body to do it but it doesn't depend on matter to exist because now this immaterial soul its immaterial dimension although we haven't talked about immateriality to a great degree we have to speak a lot on the reality of knowledge but immaterial realities are eternal they never end it's not like material things which will decompose over time has a beginning and has an end immaterial realities once actualized within us they will be with us even furthermore they are us eternally will never be separated from it they, they it's, not, it's not matter anymore it's immaterial and that's what, that's why Oytullah Hassan Zali remember when he said we've traveled from the dunya to akhirat because akhirat is an immaterial reality nothing to do with physical realities anymore it's yawmul akhir akhir meaning not necessarily last its true literal meaning is it's another um, yawm yawm means manifestation 
we call a day Yom because it manifests that, we could, that which we couldn't see at night. Yom means manifestation. It has many meanings. One is the 24-hour day. Uh, but this, it's, Yom al-Akhir means another manifestation. It's not material anymore. So these imitate, that's you now. You are your immaterial realities. Now, when you act, when you act with your body, those actions that you do, when they become second nature, you do it for, you keep on repeating and you continue doing them, they become incorporated into your soul. They become immaterial realities. The Salat has an immaterial reality. Whatever you do has an immaterial reality. That immater these immaterial realities are building over time. And they are you. It's you. So, yes, here now, this embryo, a four-month fetus onwards, it's, it has a material dimension, but it has an immaterial dimension. We say now, this soul, which was a material soul, is now, it's the same soul, but it's evolved into a material dash immaterial reality. It has an immaterial dimension. And so, an immaterial soul doesn't depend on matter to continue to exist. Because it's this dimension just continues. And that's why it's when we sleep, and we detach from the physical realm, we have some access to a lot of our immaterial dispositions we've acquired throughout the years or the, throughout the day, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, this organism, it okayed. The soul here was at a very basic material stage. Now it's an immaterial reality as well. It's much stronger now. The soul has evolved. But it's one soul. Okay, here, this, at this stage, it doesn't qualify as me. There's no I. From here onwards, the word I does qualify. But it's the, the, the unity of the soul is preserved. It's just that it's evolved. And even afterwards, until the very end, the unity along this journey is always one. It's one soul. It's one reality. Okay. Now... Here, what happens now is when we have the, if the human being now, if you forgive the, as an adult human being with all the different parts and everything, we said all our limbs, all our organs are in unity with the soul. It's just that the soul now is an immaterial reality, but it has physical manifestations. The soul was the generator of this physical side. We said the physical parts of the body are subtle manifestations of the immaterial soul but the immaterial soul is governing that's why if you take the soul away that body will just continue, will decompose the soul is generating the physical body just moment to moment and so there's a unity between the soul the immaterial soul and the uh, physical limbs and physical parts of the body there's a unity between them Okay, this much, okay, it's common sense and most people, we don't have a problem with it, those who believe in a soul. Um, there, there may be people who say this person who has a soul, that soul is material. They exist. Now here we have to discuss with them what is the nature of matter, what is the nature of knowledge, and see if what they're saying is really sensible or not. But right now, here, th this me, and we can call it a nafs, the soul and other names, it has, it's multidimensional, but it's one reality. It's not two separate realities, it's one reality. And this one reality is multidimensional. And uh, one dimension is immaterial, other dimension is physical. Now, what happens is, here, every part of this physical body is in unity with the soul. This unity is important. It's crucial to understand what I'm about to say. In medical ethics, there's a discussion on organ donation, or when you take an organ, you give an organ. When someone, the, the, their kidney, for example, has a difficulty, and they remove the kidney, they put another kidney from someone else in this body. The question arises, is this possible or not? 
okay? Would this be something doable? And here, 400 years ago, the likes of Mullah Sadra, they didn't discuss this, but with their philosophy, compared with Avicenna of a thousand years ago, what happens is, with Avicenna philosophy, you would understand that, yes, the relationship between body parts and the person is like a carpenter changing his tools. And such a thing may be extrapolated from Avicenna philosophy, that the relationship between the soul and the body, the, soul, the body is just a vehicle for the soul, and it, you can change its parts without any problem. Whereas with Mullah Sadra, who believes in a unity between soul and body, not, not a, there are two different realities. There's a unity between them. The soul is generating the body. The soul is a, um, in unity. The generator is in unity with the generated. Here, you would expect that you can't put a kidney. The recipient cannot accept a kidney. And today we see that Mullah Sadra was, was right. When you put someone else's kidney into this person, this person will die. This person will die. Because the soul, the person, through the immune system, would reject that ki kidney, won't accept it. And the person would die as, as a result. So what they do today is that person, after receiving that organ, the kidney, for example, they have to take immunosuppressives until the end of their life. If they don't consume immunosuppressives, they'll die. And immunosuppressives, it's in the name. It suppresses the immune system. The immune system is like the eye, like the ear. It's just an instrument for the soul. The functions of it, you have to attribute to the soul, to the me, I. Um, you say, I see, the soul is seeing. I hear, I am committing immune functions. It goes back to the eye. Here, when you suppress it though, you're deceiving the eye. And the eye doesn't reject it. You've suppressed the immune system. You've suppressed the immune function of the eye. And so the person continues to live. But here we see that because there's no unity, this kidney which you're placing inside this body, okay, is not in unity with the soul. Look, this was a process where the kidneys grew from this stage, grew with it, grew with the soul. The soul was animating it, was producing it, generating it. So all the limbs were in unity with the soul. If you just put another kidney there, it won't recognize it. And therefore, they're not in unity. So the kidney which they put is like a device they put, but it's thriving off the blood circulation of this patient. But this patient is not generating this kidney. The kidney isn't growing in unity with this person. It's just living off its blood circulation. Okay. And the same with all other limbs. Even a pig heart valve, the heart valve of pigs, they also, when the valve of the heart, human heart has a problem, they use pig valves. It's very similar. And here too, they have to have immunosuppression until the end of their life, otherwise they'll die. Two months ago, there was an operation done with a pig heart. So the heart of a pig was put in this human being. Now they knew this person is going to reject it, okay? And they felt immunosuppressives may not work. This is something serious now. It's a whole pig heart you are putting in. So what they did with this heart of the pig, they genetically manipulated the trigger molecule which makes the body reject that organ. They manipulated so here the soul would not reject it. So they put it in and it wasn't rejected. Here is like what immunosuppressives do. It's deceiving the soul. The soul doesn't, can't, you know, won't recognize it anymore, the immune system. And, but they, he died two or three days ago this person after two months. Two months was very little. It, so it means with animals, more research has to be done. Anyway, so here we see that, um, yes, these things are, we have to um, take, but organ donation is a very noble thing. When you donate your organs, and even when you're alive, some people 
when alive they donate, for example, one kidney, for example, to another. I mean, that, that, that shows a lot of um, courage to do such a thing. I know we have two, but to give it, it's, one is really truly sacrificing themselves. But usually people, after death, they donate. The Maharaja have different rulings. Um, some say you can't um, donate, for example, to, to non-Muslims, and that's the prevalent view, although Ayatollah Khomeini doesn't have it, any difference between them. Um, but something which is happening in organ donation, which we're not told, is informed consent. We have medical informed consent before operations. They t explain everything so you know what we're doing. And then you have to sign it. But there's something called a spiritual informed consent, where you have to tell the patient that it's very noble of you that you're going to uh, give your organ after you die, from, well, dissect it and dissect your body and take it out. But you have to be told you're going to suffer. When you're dead, the soul's alive. When we're taking your kidney away, me, as a spiritual doctor, I have to tell you, you have to be warned that you're going to suffer in the process when you see us opening your body and taking your organ. And the reason for this suffering, it's a good point, because Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli has said this, that when most of us die, because of the strong affinity to the body, we still think it's us. And so when you dissect the body, it's very painful. You say, what are you doing? What are you doing? It's so painful that if a thread of hair was to be separated from the dead body, a thread of hair was to be separated from the dead body, it's wajib to put the thread of hair back into with the body. The affinity is so strong even with a thread of hair let alone now an organ being taken out. Now, here though, if you have no affinity to the body, okay, if, if there's no affinity, you have no affinity whatsoever, then you won't suffer. But that means you've done something in your life that you've proven you have no affinity with the body. You went to Syria, for example, to fight. You were ready to give your life away. You had that spirit you won't suffer when you see your take, they're taking your kidney. You gave your kidney whilst living, alive. But if you think it's just a world of fantasia, I just write something, you can just take my kidney after I die. No. If you don't have the spirit of sacrifice, you're going to suffer there. So this has to be told. And it's not usually told, and it's being abused very badly, even in many Islamic countries. Okay. Now, when this kidney is placed, you say, my kidney, after the operation, you say, it's my kidney, or the pig heart valve, or the pig heart in that patient, you say, it's my heart now, don't you? But this my heart is like when you buy a car or a radio or something, you say, it's my, it's an arbitrary thing, but in real terms, if it's yours, it has to fit in with the unity between body and soul, which that doesn't. It's not in unity with your soul, but that doesn't matter here. You're continuing to live. But this is good to appreciate that when you say my kidney after the operation, this my is an arbitrary my, like my pen or my car. It's different to, let's say, my other kidney or my liver, which is in unity with the soul. This new kidney is not yours in real terms, the unity with the soul. But it's still yours in arbitrary terms. No one can come and take it, for example. You've paid for the operation, it was all valid, and so on and so forth. Now, and is it permissible? They don't have any problem with it, the maraje. So yes, no problem. There are some different conditions. Some have added, some have subtracted. But overall, it's a noble thing to do. It's saving life, and so on and so forth. And there's no problem with the kidney. There'll be no problem with the liver. But what about the genitalia? Male testes or female oviducts, which contain the ovaries. Now here, the same principles apply. But the, pro the problem here now, these things usually are related to kinship, nasab, the lineage, the kinship. Here, 
if the testes were to be another testes was to be received by this male person now here when it's not like the kidney because now if you're going to produce a child from this a child is going to come will it be your father will you be the father of that child when you say my testes after the operation when you say my testes after is it really yours all the spermatogonia is in the testes with the woman all the um, eggs are all present in the ovary all the eggs have come out now here with the pig valve or with the kidney let's say that the pig valve is nagis when it goes into the body the marojis say well first of all the rules of nejasa don't apply inside and second of all the orf the common lay people will say it's your kidney now after it's been you know after the operation the common lay person will say it's your kidney with the or your your heart valve or your heart so what about with the testes and the oviducts they say the same they say well after the operation they'll say it's yours oh here we have to say stop with all your respect wait a minute you have to stop here a bit this is not as easy now the question is can we say stop to the maraja here is that are we allowed to say stop it depends the maraja give the general rulings they say intoxicants it's haram to drink okay that's a general ruling we follow them but if one maraja comes and tells you that uh, pepsi is haram because it has x degree of alcohol well sometimes the degree of alcohol is very little it's, it's so little that it's not intoxicating that alcohol is not haram or najis is something many people misunderstand many foods have alcohol and they sell like certain vanilla extracts and other things and, the, and the, the reason why it's okay because not all alcohols are haram and najis it's only those which are intoxicating sometimes the percentage is so low it doesn't qualify as an intoxicator you see the actual nature of it but if it does and you give one drop, that one drop, if it is an intoxicant, one drop is najis and haram to consume. But that, the difference between two. Anyway, but, so the magic of the general ruling, then you, I say to myself, wait a minute, he's entered the particularities. He, he has to only give the general rulings. I, I've done my science. I've investigated it. No, it has no alcohol, no intoxicants. If your marja tells you that... Pepsi, he's gone into the mistag, the application now. He's come out of the universal ruling. He's given an example. If he says Pepsi is haram because it has intoxicants, but you believe it hasn't, do you have to follow the marriage? What do you think? Do you have to follow them? And the answer is no. You only follow the marriage in the universal rulings. You don't follow them in the particularities. And 80% of the differences of the maraje, 80% of them, they do, especially when you go to Hajj, you'd be surprised, there are so many different. It's not in the universal rulings, that's all the same. It's all to do with the mistaq. And then the representative of the maraje says, no, you're not allowed that. Well, give them the universal ruling, let them decide. They say, no, people, it's difficult for them to decide. Let the maraje give it, it makes life easier. And that's okay. We have no problem with that it's very kind of them to enter the mistaq it's not something bad but we have to kind of not scare people too at the same time now here with this issue if a marriage says well after the operation it's now theirs that's a big statement we have to say wait a minute now we're talking about ma'rifat here we're talking about the particularities Sorry, we can't accept this with the testes and oviduct. You want to say it with the kidney or the liver? Okay. But now this is going to lead to nasab, kinship. This is going to have a say. Even if the common lay person was to say it, this is a science in itself. It's not in unity with the soul. We're using ma'rifat. It's not in unity with the soul. Don't say it's, my, it's not theirs. So this has to be understood. This has to be discussed. 
in medical ethics, we have many difficulties. And the difficulties, because they haven't, many of them haven't truly understood the science behind it. When I was a fourth year medical student, I went to one of the Maroji and I explained human cloning. At that time, it just came 1996. I was a fourth year medical student. That Maroji had given a fatwa already and said this is one of the major haram actions. It, it's in his book. I went and like this, I was just explaining everything to him. I was only a student. Afterwards, he wrote that one cannot say this is one of the haram actions. Look, he, and he, he gave me the sentence, the statement, as a present, you can keep it, yes. And in, in his books it came, you can't say human cloning is haram. What, what made the difference? Why did the manager change his opinion? Only because of the particularities wasn't explained to him very well. That happens, that happens. So they have to have very good advisors, expert, expert, and they do, most of them do, but still. So here with the testes and the oviduct, we have a problem here. Whereas most of the Maharaja say that after the operation, it's theirs, just like the one that they had before the operation. But is it really theirs? It's going to cause problems. This hasn't been opened up too much. It's a serious issue. We're seeing this, yes in the infertility, infertility clinic, which I'm um, part of a think tank there. This is a problem. Another issue which is um, in its early days right now, but in the future it may become a very easy thing, brain transplants. So here, for example, if you have... Um, if you have two people here, so we have A and B, and then this has been done on animals in the 1970s. They did it with chimpanzees. There was head, head transplants. And after, when they put one head of a chimpanzee on the other, that chimpanzee became um, paralyzed from neck downwards. Then they said it's not ethical and everything, they stopped the research. But uh, in the 1970 uh, successful operation, which has been documented in the journal Surgery, when they taught this chimpanzee certain things, after the transplant, the head transplant, not the brain, the whole head was transplanted, this was um, doing things which was, it was taught before the actual operation. And the monkey lived for eight minutes, and then the monkey died. Now here, the question is, with humans, if the brain of A, look A, this was A, it started, grew, became immaterial, started growing, now it's like this. Now, they have an accident and the body is burned, the brain can be preserved and you put the, let's imagine this is Mr. Peter, for example, and this is, let's say, Mr. John. If you put Peter's brain and let's imagine John, his brain has been injured, they've removed it, they've put Peter's brain in John. Okay? This is Peter, this is John. You've put Peter's brain into John. Okay? When you tell B, John, what's your name? What will he say? Peter. Yes. Because memory is part of the functions of the brain. The eye sees, the ear hears. One of the functions of the brain is memory. Here, would this new, this person, whose brain has been taken away, and this brain of A has been put in B, is this person Peter or John? Peter. Or is it John? Who says Peter? Who says John? You say John. You say that, rem that still remains as John. Well done. That's good, yes. At least, that's very good. Yes, this is still John. You've just put a brain. The brain happens, one of its functions to be memory. If you, have, if you put, for example, a kidney, it would have been, 
the kidney functions. The brain happens to have memory, one of its functions, and it will say John. But here, before the operation, John was this embryo, had reached this stage, this is, the soul is active. All the limbs are, you know, manifestations of the soul, it's all in unit, it's one reality. Now you've just taken the brain away. The soul is still there, present. Now you've put someone else's brain. It doesn't change the soul of the person. It doesn't change the me of the person. And that's why, although the Maharaj haven't spoken yet of this, it's not because it's far away to go. But I wouldn't be surprised, and it should, the ruling should be that, it's haram to do such a thing. Even if it's possible, okay, they would say it's haram to do this. Why? Can anyone guess why? Because this Peter had a wife, had children. All the memory will go to John. So John will get access to be like, you know, Tajassus, having all the knowledge of personal information here, of Peter. That's not allowed. That's definitely a sin. It's definitely a sin. At, if, at this stage of it, at least. If it was a brain with, without memory, let's say, there it's possible. Yes, a brain which a two-year-old's brain, let's say, is placed and the two-year-old has died. The brain has been preserved. The two-year-old has no memory. You put it into John and John now works with this brain. It will be very good and would be permissible. There's no threat here. But John is John. John is John. Now you put someone else's brain, John will live longer and do things now. When his brain was injured, he couldn't do anything. They put someone else's brain, but John has to start all over again. If he was a 40-year-old businessman, when you put a two-year-old's brain there, and we say it's okay because there's no tajessus or of that sort, that John's not going to be the same John anymore. It is John, but they're learning from, they have to learn from scratch again. Language they have to learn, they have to learn many things because their brain is gone. They have a two-year-old brain now. They have to learn like a two-year-old. But John is John. This does not become Peter with a brain transplantation. That's a very important point, which this really shows, because John was an embryo, grew, 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 became immaterial, grew, grew. The soul now with the body, it's one reality. You've just, the brain and the kidney, the rulings are the same here. You've taken one part, you've put it. When you've put the kidney of someone else, it's still John. The liver of someone else into John, you still say it's John. Someone's eye, it's still John. The brain too, it's still John. It's just that the brain's functions are more complex. One is memory, but memory is just a function of that brain. And it won't make John Peter, because the soul of John is there. The soul of John is here. And when he receives the brain, he has to take immunosuppressives until the rest of his life, because the body would reject the brain. Is this, it's very logical here. The, um, yes. Okay, so that's another issue. And so sometimes they <coughs> ask that, let's say if, you know, the brain has two hemispheres, what's connecting them is this something called a corpus callosum. Sometimes when children have an accident, a car accident, one brain, all its information is passed on to the other before the brain gets damaged. There are some mechanisms which happen. Some say, therefore, it's theoretically possible that the two brains can have the same information. They say it's theoretically possible, although each has its own functions, but certain things may happen. But theoretically, if let's say the two hemispheres were, had the same information of one person, and then they were divided into two, that person had died, they got the brain, divided the two hemispheres to, from one another, put one hemisphere in A, one in B, Okay, so let's say this is Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. X, his brain. The two hemispheres were divided, one hemisphere in A, another in B. Then they ask this as a dilemma question. So are these two Mr. X? But with our understanding of the soul, no. Mr. A is Mr. A, Mr. B is Mr. B. No one is Mr. X here, Mr. X has died. And these are the soul and naps of Mr. A and B. You've just put their brain. Now the information, their memories are different now. 
Okay. Another issue which this is important for is um, when you have a male person with a male anatomy, all male anatomy. Now we said there's a unity between the soul and the body. The body is all male. And this suggests that the soul, the generator here, is male. And there's a unity between the body and the soul. And here in genetics they say it's yes, this is 46 XY. That's the genetics of someone who's male. Females are 46 XX. But sometimes you get someone whose anatomy is all male. But their genetics is 46 XX. Sorry, this. So which one is this person male or female? The genetics is 46 XX. The genetics at the genetic level, but the anatomy is um, when you see it, it's all male. How do, are we? How are we going to explain that? And here they say, and this has. This is documented, it's happened, and it's increasing more and more. No, this is a male anatomy. Male anatomy, you're male. Genetics won't be a criterion. And this 46XX, even though it's male, the reason was because, you know, 46XY, these are sex chromosomes. The Y being male, X being female. Here, um, the, there's a gene on the, of the Y chromosome which makes someone male with male uh, um, anatomy. Um, a gene sometimes uh, they call it cross linking. It cross links to the X chromosome. So the person is 46XX. Okay? But a gene has cross linked into here and this has happened. So it's all male. But the genetics is 46XX. So this XXXY isn't a criterion. The criterion is the actual physical body, which the soul is generating and it is in unity with. These things happen. The other way, someone, someone is female, totally female. But their chromosome, it, their genetic status is 46XY. But they're totally female. And that's why, because the SRY gene in the Y chromosome, it's become deleted. And it's that gene which leads to the features, the male features of a person. And it's become deleted and the person is all female. But the chromosome level at a genetic level is 46XY. These things happen. So, for us, sex is only a function of the anatomy, the manifestation of the soul. How is the soul manifesting? When it has all the male parts, it's, it's male. Now, yes, gender, that's a function of one's brain. Gender is a function of one's psychology. That's another issue. Psychology evolves from child, you know, from one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, depending on the environment, how they were raised, certain things have been done. That you can play. You can, a man, you can play with their psychology if you don't nurture them properly and then they acquire a female psychology is a man but the psychology is female that's possible and in Islam we have so many ahadith from two years onwards there are so many ahadith which when the scholars look at them they say there's only one reason we have so many ahadith on how to raise children after two and that is we want to nurture the sexual identity properly one of those hadith for example is after two years of age, if it's a boy, a man must bathe him. If it's a girl, the mother must bathe him. Look, after two, after three, there are other sets of instructions. Four, five, six, it gets heavier and heavier. Okay, so look, a number of different issues have been mentioned here. With a, and, and it's all based on this relationship between the soul and body. It's not, you know, mutually exclusive to matters pertaining to the soul and body. 
So here, the knowledge of the relationship between the soul and body sometimes has an effect on understanding what's happening. When, when you have a, fem- a, ma- a male body, imagine, a male body, and this male has a female psychology, it's possible. They call them tran- transgender people. Yes, it's a male body, but the psychology is female. Now, this person is suffering, okay? And they amputate certain parts of the body, they receive hormonal therapy and add certain parts. After this amputating and adding, can you say that the sex has changed the female? Look, you have Mr. A, was an embryo, grew normally, now has an immaterial side, grew normally, is an adult, has a male um, anatomy. The female, the psychology though is female. So there's a kind of discordance between psychology and body. He's suffering. So he chops off a few body parts, he adds one or two body parts. Can you say now this person, Mr. A, is a woman, the sex is female? Yes, you say no? You say no? You say yes? Yes. Okay. Now, this is the issue here. Based on this matter of fact, it's no. You can't just chop a part of a body and add and so, something. That thing that you're adding is not in unity with the soul. You can't just chop a few parts and then say, now this is a woman. Even if the common lay person will say, well, this is a woman now. Well, actually... The, or if the common lay person has to be an informed common lay person who knows about the matter of fact here. Just adding or taking away doesn't make this person, the sex, female. Because that, those things that you've added, they're not in unity with the soul. So here, if a manager says it is female, okay, he's entered the particularities. It's not a universal ruling. You don't have to follow in the particularities. This is a very important point. This, we have to think about this because a lot of the differences we see, it's only because of this. The universal points, there's no problem. It's just that when you want to apply the particularities, these differences happen, but we don't follow anyone. The duty bound has that ultimate responsibility. Okay, so there are many issues that all are pivoted around this matter of fact of the body-soul relationship. And you can't say, look, this, this body-soul relationship, we're not saying we're using them to give a fatwa. Okay? It's like the Pepsi thing. Saying that the intoxicants are haram to consume is a universal thing. Okay? But whether Pepsi is or isn't, that needs data. That data, we don't have to follow anyone. We follow the experts and the data. We just follow the magic and the universal. And so many differences of opinion may arise over time. Okay, I'll stop there, inshallah. I thought maybe to give you a glimpse of some of the repercussions of this body-soul journey, how it can have a big you know, role in these kind of issues. Okay, yes, I have a question. yes. yes. Right. Right. Soul is universal and one. Right. But then God has created a human form in male and female. Yes. So how does this uh, psychology, woman psychology, interact with the soul and how can it be compatible? You see, when the soul doesn't have any sort of this thing, okay. gender or something, so yes. how can it, it come? Yes. Now we haven't touched upon this, but just to give a concise answer, this soul, this me, is multidimensional. There's one dimension which is purely immaterial. That doesn't have sex. But there's a dimension of the soul which isn't material and isn't purely immaterial. It's like our dreams. In our dreams, there is male and female. There's no body, there's no physical 
There's no, nothing physical in our dreams. But there is a body in our dream. There is woman, male, female, things to eat. But they're all immaterial. We call it these semi-immaterial realities. And here, the semi-immaterial soul, that can manifest. Because this male anatomy is in unity with the soul. Okay, not with the purely immaterial dimension, but it is possible to be in contact, in unity, with the semi-immaterial dimension. Yes. yes. Now, with the, with the psychology point you were mentioning, yes, as from four months onwards, the knowledge factor now is evolving. What do they see? What do they do? As a child, one year, two year, three years, it's all perception after perception is growing and it's all immaterial but this is a male body but as a result of certain things they saw and did the perceptions may keep on becoming female 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 yes see means like let's say uh, that there's a soul yes but it's it's neither male or nor female but it has got a multi-dimensional yes that is the reason uh, male feelings has been aroused towards female and female's feelings has been aroused towards male. Right. You mean to say that? Right, okay. Yeah. This is what you have said, that semi-soul, what you have said. No, yes. I was just trying to answer, when you said the soul is not male or female, yeah. you're right in one way. Yeah. When you say the I, the essence of the I, me, yeah. there's no male or female there. However, there are dimensions which can lead to a male or female bodily manifestation. And that we call the barzakhi, or semi-immaterial dimension. Barzakhi. Barzakh, semi-immaterial. Semi-immaterial. Yes. Yes. We haven't, we haven't discussed it in the book yet, but the question you raised, yes, that's it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome, yes. Yes, yes. 50% Sheikh, on the question, uh, the question on the brain part, yes. I'm not completely convinced about the Peter and John. And I think yes. uh, so this is I'm linked. Peter. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you which part I'm not yes. convinced. Yes. If you take Peter's brain, brain and yes. put it into John's, okay. I, is it I don't think it's just a memory that transfers over. His personality would transfer over, right. his skill set would transfer over everything would transfer over. Yes. So, even though it's John's body, yes. it's Peter in John's body. Yes. It's so, Peter, Peter's memory, Peter's personality, Peter's X, Peter's Y, Peter's Z. But it's not Peter's soul. Because here, when you put the brain here, this body is still kept alive. Okay? And the, the, soul, the soul is here. It's in unity with the rest of the body parts here. Yes, this is going to cause a lot of change in John. One was memory, only one aspect was memory. But yes, you're right. It has many more other things. Even the hormone setup of John will completely change because the pituitary glands are in the brain. And that's why with memory alone, if it was only memory, we would say it's haram because now John is getting information he wasn't privy to. But yes, there are many other things too. The personality will change, this will change, that will change. That, that we have to you know, analyze differently. Would it be permissible, not permissible? But if it was a two-year-old brain we put here, it would be less problematic. So, because if you were to, I'm just thinking out loud right now, but if you were, if, instead of Peter and John, if it was two women, right? okay? Yes. Let's say uh, Patricia and Jane, Yes. Patricia for example. Jane. Okay, you take Patricia's brain and put it into Jane. And Jane, yes. Now we go to in the in the process of consummating, and uh, uh, they get or pregnant or whatever yes, yes, the embryo comes. Yes, in. Yes. When the process of the embryo starts, yes. one could argue is that the brain sends a signal. Once the fertilization happens, right. it's the brain that sends a signal yes. for the whole process to start. No, that's okay. But we have said that it's the soul yes. that instigates it. Yes. The brain. So is, is it in Jane? Is it Patricia's yes. brain or? Mm -hmm. James you know, if soul. you put Patricia's eyes into Jane's eyes, okay, it's the soul of Jane. It's just seeing with this instrument of Patricia. 
but the soul of Jane is seeing. The brain is just like the eye. It's just, as, it just instead of seeing, it's much more complex. There's so many added parameters to it. It's a material instrument at the end of the day. Would it not be in the same category of uh, the brain and the reproductive system? How you said, because it gives uh, the genetics it of the It may give it, but the, the point is, this Jane has a body of her own right now, before the operation. And this body is in, this body is in unity with her soul. By putting just an egg, something in, that's not going to change. You're not going to have two souls. The soul is still the same. And Patricia's soul remains here. When you take her brain, now she's without a brain. But she'll just live but without any perceptions. The soul, this is the point. The soul is still there, the soul is there. The soul doesn't move, doesn't change. It's a very delicate point, this. And this will become feasible. It's not rationally impossible. So the fact was, will come in the late future, yes. Yes. There's a brain. You yes. say that the brain has a part of memory, part of intellect and everything. Yes. So how does this soul connect with it? Because after all, it is a material. Brain is a material. Yes. So when the brain died, yes. let's say the body died. Yes. So does that information which is remaining in this thing, brain, has been absorbed by soul? No, we said knowledge isn't in the brain. We did say this. Right. Knowledge isn't so, stored in the brain. So like what is the role of brain? How does it for example, each other? When you see something with your eye, ah. you say, I ah. see. If you put uh, the physical eye on a table, it won't see anything. Right. Only in a live body, but you say, I, the soul, see. The, and the unity between the soul and the physical eye the physical eye is an instrument for the soul to see. The physical ear is an instrument for the soul to hear. The physical brain is an instrument for the soul to do a number of things. Now, these number of things, day after day, perception after perception, the soul is growing, existentially becoming stronger so into all these immaterial perceptions. When one dies and the brain decomposes, those perceptions won't die though. Because they're immaterial. They are with us. You're right. They are with us eternally. Eternally. Hassan said, said we've, we've traveled from the dunya to akhirah. Because akhirah is a function of your soul. Metaphysics. Yes. Metaphysics. Yes. Good. Thank you. Very delicate point, this. It's very, very important, yes. Yes. From one, uh, from one body to another. Yes. And you, there is an assumption that that brain will function. Yes. In your explanation, that yes. the brain will function. Because of what they did with chimpanzees, for eight minutes, they taught this chimpanzee something. After the operation, it followed with this chimpanzee's body and the head of A. Right. It followed. So the assumption isn't a far-fetched one. Okay? But my conclusions are based on if this was to be assumed that it would function. That it would yes, function. Yes, yes. Because there's nothing, it's like the kidney, like the liver. It's possible. It's not rationally impossible. Mm. But you have to give immunosuppressives. But, but the, brain, the brain is a processing center. Yes. For the You just link different... it with the blood circulation of the person. Everything should follow. But the immunosuppression has to be given. It's just going to be much more finer, much more complicated, but it's possible. You have to just connect it, yes, with the whole nervous system, that is, yes. Yes, it's just very difficult, but I'm, I'm assuming it's not rationally impossible. If it's rationally impossible, then the whole thing, there's no point discussing it, but this is being discussed, and the head of the chimpanzee was put on the body of the other one. But there, since there was no nervous system also at the same time, they became decerebrated. And so the, ch the chimpanzee who received another um, chimpanzee was paralyzed. That was because they didn't have the technology to transplant a, a, nerve, a central nervous system. Right. But the brain they did. 
Yes. So it's not something. So when they after the brain, they connected with the blood circulation of the chimpanzee. Mm -hmm. I just I just see it as something almost impossible to work unless there is a preparation for yes. that brain, prior preparation for that brain to be transplanted. Yes. Because there's the yes. brain is collecting a memory on how to uh, manage the body parts. Yes, uh, there's a relationship mm -hmm. over time based on strengths, weaknesses, yes. etc. So yes. I just find you know for for yes. a sudden change, I don't see that it to be possible as I said, for that no, to no, be successful. Right, no, um, to say it's rationally impossible, mm. it's like someone thousand years ago saying, someone saying, I, I can't see us going on the moon thousand years ago. You know, we're, we're just walking here. <laughs> the only, to go on the moon means to fly. I, it's not right, but there's nothing which says it's rationally impossible. As long as it's not rationally impossible, there's, there's no problem in thought experimenting. Right. Yes. But this was in the 70s. In the 60s, the, it was a space war between the Soviet Union and America. Mm. At the same time, there was another war. Brain transplants. This is all documented. Mm. The, the second like, uh, question or concern, doubt that I have is that if, if we assume this, yes. then we assume also that the, that the soul is uh, if you take like a uh, give it a border the border of the soul is the edge to edge of the body uh, why because here you say that okay if you remove the the, the brain, brain the head yeah. or the brain you put Into it somewhere body, else yeah. the soul remains where it is the soul of b this is a's brain goes into b the soul doesn't change the soul is where it is like a kidney transplant but the but the but the head or the brain of of a yeah, the, the brain was is a, put a, in B. a part of the soul itself. Yes, it's just like the kidney. Look, the kidney, this A with the kidney, this is exactly the same as a kidney. The right. difference is only qualitative here. Yeah. This kidney mm -hmm. of A was in unity with A, A soul. Then it goes there. That's why B will reject the kidney. Now you put a brain there. It's going to reject it. Because the soul isn't, this brain isn't in unity with this soul. That's why you have to give immunosuppressives. Mm. This patient who receives a kidney of someone else to the, to the end of their life, they have to take immunosuppression. Otherwise, they'll mm. die. But, Chef, one more question. Yes. Do animals have a soul? Yes. They have a soul? Yes, yes. There was once a scholar from India. I was speaking in America yeah. about this. Huh? Very polite person. He came at the end of the talk and he came to me he said I'm from a city in India and um, you are wrong animals don't have souls and he was a very elderly gentleman oh, this is being recorded yes this part of the recording then just delete so he, he said animals don't have a souls you're wrong and I said thank you very much thank you, you know, there was no point in arguing because he was used to a certain yeah. but now med medicine has proved this because on the animal brain they've put certain, you know, uh, the EEGs and monitoring things. And there's a lot of activity here. Yes. This activity, just like, you know, with comparable to human activity that we see, just of a different nature, yes. So they have a soul. Yeah, uh, Okay, I just wanted to ask, yes. we, we mentioned here that uh, at death the body does disintegrate. The body disintegrates, disintegrate, right? Yes, okay, yes, yes. but the perceptions are still there. Yes. Because the, the soul is eternal, right? No, the is perceptions are immaterial, yeah. so the perceptions <coughs> are eternal. eternal. And we are our perceptions. Yeah. We are our actions. Okay, so does that mean that, uh, say, say, a family member has passed away, right. does that mean the presence is still there with us? Because now, the perceptions yes. are still there, does that mean? It's, it's possible that the deceased soul yeah. okay, can have contact with us. It is possible, yes. And even us, with refining our souls, we can get contact with dead spirits, for example. It is possible. All these are... We, we can enter their realm of immateriality. It requires a certain level of detaching from the physical realm, but these things are possible and it's rec recorded and the summoning of the spirits and, yes. Yes.
Okay. There was just one last point which I wanted to mention. It was in your question, actually, yes. Oh, yes, there's one verse of the Quran in relation to Nabi Nuh, alayhi salam, and his son. He said, قَالَ يَا إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ Your son isn't one of your family. إِنَّهُ Verily he, إِنَّهُ أَمَلٌ غَيْرُ صَالِحِ He is non-righteous actions. You are your actions. You, the me. You are your actions. Actions include aqaid and these physical actions which become part of you. It's you. This remains after death. Materialists just don't believe in anything immaterial. They even say the spirit, for example. We have Muslim scholars. You'd be surprised if I give the names. They say the spirit is physical, but it's a very delicate physical thing. When you say physical, you've spoiled the whole thing. What do you mean a delicate thing? They say everything, they, yeah, they, say, ev they, they say we don't have anything immaterial. Allahu Akbar. There's nothing immaterial. Dreams, it's physical. We have nothing, Im only one thing is immaterial. Although this is Alhamdulillah, at least they say it's one thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only Allah is immaterial. Everything else is physical. We have big scholars. In fact, the history of Islam. It's all recorded. It's all documented. They've said this. Many people today believe in it. And uh, it, it, this is a science in itself. It's philosophy, ma'rifat. Yes, and so yes. So in the Quran it says this is a Quranic reference. You are your actions. You're not your body. You're not your body, your physical body. That's going to decompose, but you are going to continue. This is, this is something, a Quranic reference. Now, a guru, a guru may say this, but the, where is their reference? The reference is important. If they bring a reference from their books, that would be very noble. But this is a Quranic reference. What, whatever the Orafa say, they refer it to the Quran. These people, in my opinion, they're getting it from the Quran. Because they never give a reference. But they say, save soil, for example. Save soil, they do say. Yes. Okay.